Hello, Chick Chang back with another summary, and this time we will be starting the Kilo 5 trilogy, Halo Glasslands, being the first book taking place just after Halo 3 and Ghost of Onyx. So without further delay, let's begin. Before I get into it, in order to have no confusion, the time in Onyx will always be November of 2552, while pretty much everything else will be about three months later, and that is because time inside of Onyx goes by much, much slower. So inside the Onyx Core, which itself is in slipspace somewhere, we meet up with Dr. Halsey, Chief Mendez, Spartans Fred, Kelly, Linda, and the five other Spartan Threes, Tom, Lucy, Olivia, Ash, and Mark. Many still reeling from the deaths of those that sacrificed themselves to get inside the core, and extra tension between Halsey and Mendez over the Spartan Three program. The first thing they want to do is scout around for food and hopefully a way out if there is one. Eventually they find some structures and head towards them. Halsey during this time is contemplating everything leading up to this point in her life believes the war to be lost, so that's why she kidnapped Kelly and tricked Admiral Hood into sending Blue Team to Onyx, under the impression that there was technology that could save them all. She might actually be, you know, accidentally correct. Her main reason for Onyx was to save her Spartans, but she does have other influences in her decision. Eventually, her thoughts come to John, Cortana, and finally her daughter, Miranda. January 2553, on the glass planet New Linelli, Captain Saren Osmond watches Phillips, a Singhealy expert, conversing with a Singhealy named Avu Med Telkam, the leader of the Servants of the Abiding Truth, which was a rebel faction to the Arbiter Thel Vidan. Eventually, Phillips returns to her, telling her that Telkam would like to have a word with her, and that she should avoid certain terms, such as Elite or Hingehead, which makes sense. So she starts to converse with the Singhealy commander. Telkam explains that he wants to bring the Singhealy back to their rightful place in the universe. Due to the false prophets, and in his opinion, the heretical things Thel Vidam says, their race has fallen from grace. But with the San Shium gone, only Thel Vidam stands in the way, so he needs to kill the Arbiter. Osman asks how he plans to do that since they don't really have much of a force at the moment, but Telkam confirms this and Osman asks if they could win if she were to supply them. Obviously Telkam is skeptical and asks why she would even do this. After all, the Arbiter sides with the humans. Which is precisely why, in my opinion, this is all stupid, but... Osmond tells him that the humans like to gamble, and she thinks that his side will win. After all, dead allies are of no use. This seems to win over the elite, and in return, they have a truce. Additionally, they will both keep it on the down low, because neither of them would like the respective sides to know what's going on. Telkam, his followers, and for Osmond and Oni, the rest of the UNSC. So the deal is made. Osmond leaves and thanks Phillips for making it all happen, and further realizes that for a civilian, he may not be as naive as she thought. Once prepped and off the planet, she contacts the head of Oni, Admiral Margaret Parangoski, and lets her know that the deal's done. Before being out of sight of the planet's surface, Osman sees the glass planet, and any reservations she had about the mission she had undertook was gone. She will do anything to make sure nothing like this ever happens to humanity again, which in the end is pretty understandable. January 26th, 2553, Sydney, Australia, two months after the Battle for Earth. A couple of ODSTs, Mal Geffen and Vasily Belloy, we're looking for a bar so they can raise a drink in honor of a fallen comrade of theirs, Emmanuel. Trying to get it done before their meeting with the Admiral of Oni, they find the bar, but it had been destroyed during the war. They stress over the meeting, wondering what's going to happen to them, but eventually agree to drop it since fretting over it won't help. A construction worker walks towards them, which turns out to be an attractive redhead, and asks what they are doing. Mal explains what's going on, and since they won't be able to get anything for a toast, she actually hands them some juice in order for them to do what they came for. Afterwards, she asks if the war is really over. They are not sure, but they confirm that the fighting has stopped, which is something. They leave, and while they walk away, everyone nearby gives them an applause, which Mal appreciates. At the Oni base, later the same day, Osmond meets with the Admiral. During this time, she converses with David Ngoli, who happens to be the Minister of the Colonies, apparently not a fan of the Oni Admiral, and mentions that Osmond is the heir apparent to Parangoski. Osmond is called in for her meeting and meets with the Admiral's AI, Black Box, who will be referred to as BB for the rest of this time. Once in the room, Margaret states that she's happy that they have met, and tells Osmond that she can trust BB with her life, which makes her uneasy but not necessarily disappointed. Onyx comes up at some point, and for them it has disappeared from sight but left an electromagnetic signature the size of a solar system. It's in slip space, so that's why it can't be seen, but why it gives off a reading. Which brings them to Dr. Halsey. Knowing she abducted Kelly and talked Admiral Hood into sending Blue Team, minus John, to Onyx as well, then used the Forerunner tech to disappear. Doesn't exactly put her on Oni's good graces, which is but one thing on a long list of horrible stuff that she's done. 
The Admiral sees it as the Doctor dipping out with billions of dollars in assets, so she wants them back and might see that Halsey gets the death penalty for it. Osmond also isn't a big fan of Halsey because of what happened to her. Osmond asks if she will be heading to assist with the Onyx situation, but Perangoski tells her that the Sanghealy threat is still number one priority, but she should be ready in case something comes up. They agree to state that Halsey died on Reach in order to avoid any possible issues with the Spartans, since they all think that the Doctor walks on water. Granted, Spartans can be trusted, but there was no sense in pushing it. Osmond does wonder why Perangoski hates Halsey so much, since there are plenty of awful people working for her or for Oni, obviously. Once she told her that Halsey had lied to her, but there had to be more since Oni was all about lies. Before leaving to meet her team, she's told of who will be a part of it. Naomi, or Spartan 010, three ODSTs, Mal Geffen, Baz Belloy, and Leon Devereaux, and Dr. Evan Phillips, which she wasn't aware of him joining, but the Admiral made a last minute addition. Then BB was officially assigned to the captain. Back in the Forerunner Sphere, three hours later. Halsey and her group are patrolling around, seeing the wildlife and wondering what else could be within the S.H.I.E.L.D. world, and to what extent was the world supposed to work, like how many people are aliens, for how long, and things of that nature. She does this until Mendez and her decides it's time to have a talk. It starts civil, but Mendez eventually tells her that if she has a problem with the Spartan 3 program, to take it up with him. She's a bit offended by this and tells him that she has no problem with the other Spartans. After all, she came here to save them. Halsey did pick Onyx because, you know, there were Spartans there, but did also think that the possibility of finding 400 tech was decent, so she did in the end kind of get lucky, but there was a little bit of calculation to it too. A mini sentinel shows up, flying down incredibly fast towards the group. Tom tackles Halsey to shield her, but nothing really happens. Once back on her feet, they notice it's just floating there. Kelly reaches out towards it, but at that moment, the object dips out. Tom takes off his helmet to scratch his head, and Halsey notices the bruise on his chin from Kurt. She thanks him for protecting her. The same day, on St. Helios at Beckham Keep, Jewel Ndama talks with his wife about how he has to go to the Kaidan's Keep since the Arbiter will be there. Raya, his wife, states that there are more immediate problems to them than the humans. Sanghili need to realize that they are more than just warriors. Jewel doesn't want to intervene in her work, but that just pisses her off. The Sanshium had made them into their permanent army, therefore they don't know how to do pretty much anything else for the most part. No farmers, factory workers, or engineers. Jewel thinks that they can do it, but admits that the humans don't have this problem. They seem to be jacks of all trades, as they put it. On the way to the keep, he sees sense in what his wife had said. And after arriving to the Kaidon's keep, Jewel meets with his friend Forze, where they talk about the possibility of making a council of Kaidon's. With the prophets gone, they need some sort of leadership. Thelvedam arrives and gives a speech, calling for the unity because a civil war is the last thing he wants to deal with. The Great Schism did so much damage already, they need to spend time recovering. Jewel agrees with what the Arbiter is saying, but he still despises him because of his working with the humans, even though it saved all their asses. But not the point. Jewel calls out the Arbiter, stating that they should attack now while they would least expect it. But Thel points out that they are in a worse position than before, and they failed then, so attacking now would literally be insane. In the end, Thel states that he will agree to a truce with the humans in order to stop the fighting. Jewel tries a last-ditch effort to call the humans liars and thieves, all humans being unhonorable. But this was the last straw for Thel. There were honorable humans. He fought alongside them in order to win the war and survive the schism. This does not change Jewel's mind, but he wasn't going to take any action here anyways. So in the end, he just has to leave. Back in Sydney, Kilo 5 all get to meet each other. Mal and Vaz meet Leon, who will go by Dev, making some jokes until Naomi shows up. And even out of Mjolnir, they knew what she was. Then the Admiral walks in with Captain Osman and Professor Phillips, which everyone is told that they do not need to take up the mission that they are about to be assigned, which none of them actually believe since they have more than earned the right to say no. Nobody says anything. So Perangoski continues, the mission being to cause discontent amongst the Sangheili. Because there is already tension between the Arbiter and other factions, it won't be hard to do that. In the end, everyone agrees, and Bibi introduces himself to everyone else. Four hours later, on the Forerunner Shield world, Mendez is walking with Tom. Tom is still grasping at hope that Kirk could still be alive, but Mendez gently assures him that not even a Spartan can take on that many Covenant alone. Mendez then goes over his issues with Halsey in his head. She had dropped the Spartan 2 project because, in her opinion, the next set of candidates were not up to par. So, not because she had some change of heart, but just because he didn't think that they were good enough. Also, the cloning and kidnapping doesn't help, although he did go along with it the entire time. Realizing he's in denial about the situation, he focuses on the crisis at hand. Both groups rendezvous at the tower and proceed to look for a way in. Halsey opens something, and more of the Sentinels come out, but don't seem to be a threat. Kelly is able to grab one and describes it as weightless. 
Halsey gets involved confirming what Kelly said and is amazed by it. Lucy, in one of the other Spartan 3s, is scouting the chamber because she thought she could hear something nearby in the shadows. Halsey finds that odd since they had activated the shield world, so nothing else should be there, but it seems that they are not alone. January 27th, 2553, on board their ship, Port Stanley. Osmond is still getting used to the captain's chair, literally and figuratively. Everyone else is ready for launch and BB tells the captain that the professor was a late addition and that's why she wasn't aware of him. She's not really bothered by it, but it is worrying because he may not be silent after the mission is over. BB tells her not to worry because worst case scenario, he can always make sure that he is silent. Naomi shows up and tells Osmond that she feels like she recognizes her. After all, she's been staring her down since they met, and Osmond lets it out. She was a part of the Spartan program as well with Naomi, Saren 019, but she had washed out and almost died. Oni put her back together again and there she is, not too shabby. Naomi thought she had died and Osmond realizes that the other Spartans were told by Halsey that that is what happened. Something of note is that Osmond gets nauseous during slip space jumps and while others notice, they don't hold it against her. The Oni Admiral even makes sure that she has Ginger with her to help with it, showing that she's not always, showing that she is not always so heartless. After entering slip space, BB notifies her that the UNSC patrol ship Ariadne was having technical problems and were denied aid by Venencia, which just so happens to be an insurrectionist planet. Unable to really get a, give aid themselves at this point, she wants them to be checked on regularly to know what's up. Back with our good old buddy Jewel, he goes to see his Kaidan, Levu Imdama, and asks about his stance with the Arbiter, and it's not the answer that he wants. Levu says that they are not in shape to eradicate the humans, or similar to what the Arbiter already said. Not that he likes them, but thinks peace is necessary for them to recover. Jewel admits to himself that what Levu is saying also makes sense to him, but he wants to kill humans so badly it doesn't really matter. So he needs to find a group that he can join with similar goals, because he doesn't want to kill Levu himself, which is entirely his right to do if he so pleases. So at least he's somewhat smart about his actions. When Jewel gets home, Raya lectures him and tells him Forze called about Relon, who was going to bomb some holy structures. After all, the gods are apparently gone. Jewel gets some food and contemplates how to get his people to fight together. A little later, he's notified that Relon's keep was on fire. At first, panicked that maybe the humans had attacked, but then he was told that it was plasma fire, saying Helia had attacked their own. Jewel decides to head there and see what's going on. The scene he arrives to was almost too much for his battle-hardened self to handle. Relon and his brother were hanged and their bodies mutilated. With the message, we do not allow blasphemers to live. The gods demand a return to piety, truth abides. Levu was there as well and recognizes the writing. The servants of the abiding truth had attacked. So those that are being armed by Oni. I wonder what's gonna happen there. They used to just be monks, but during the covenant, the Sanshium allowed them to become warriors. Jewel knows that if they are willing to do this to some old warriors for blowing up some meaningless ruins, they would surely go off on the Arbiter for his heretical views and lack of aggression towards the humans. So something interesting, the quote by Perengoski on why they try to force colonies under the UNSC to fold. Because UNSC budgets and UNSC heavy lift enabled those colonies to exist, because the UNSC needs as many supply bases in deep space as it can get, and because they're human, they're us. In a galaxy of hostile aliens, you're either for us or you're the enemy. Which honestly makes sense, not that the UNSC has done everything perfectly when it comes to dealing with the insurrection, but the Innies haven't really been saints either. And I mean, without the UNSC, they wouldn't have even been able to survive anyways. So the insurrection don't really have much of a hill to stand on and try to act like they're the better. Back with the Spartans on the shield world, Lucy is still looking around inside the tower, but due to basically no light and all the surfaces being black, it's impossible to tell where exactly you're going. She accidentally runs into a wall, which causes her heart rate to spike. This gets Tom's attention, but she says without any words that she's all good. Mendez once again tells her to hold position while they fetch the doctor. But because she knows that enemies are potentially nearby, she continues, her panic creeping back because she was trying to make sense of the blackness. Tom comes up to her and tries to knock some sense into her by giving her a couple headbutts. It seems to do the trick and Tom starts looking around in a different direction. Halsey shows up and looks around the walls, finding a control panel. From what she gathers, it apparently controls the environmental controls of the structure. Lucy again goes off on her own to find out what's lurking in the shadows. Tom realizes she's off on her own again and tells her to wait. Fred even comes over comms asking her where the hell she was. She gave a signal back stating that she was okay so they could just chill out. But she does end up finding a wall that she was able to pass through. First her hand, then her arm, then her whole body. The floor underneath her disintegrates and she falls down a tube until reaching the ground. The lights seem to come on, but she was not able to report anything because she lost any signal with the rest of her team. But at least she still had her rifle. Aboard Port Stanley, Vaz and Naomi are going through the weapons that they are going to be delivering to Telcam. Vaz wondering if and when things will go wrong. 
Naomi being a bit awkward but making conversation, she clearly isn't used to being a part of a team that isn't all Spartans. They discuss why the Sangheili don't have weapons and who they will use it on. The Great Schism really screwed them over, so they will use the weapons on anyone who gets in their way. However, the conversation is interrupted by the sound of Sangheili talking. Turns out, Phillips was listening to a recording. Baz asks if he is okay with shafting the elites like this, and Phillips tells him that he'd basically rather survive than die morally pure. Besides, the only reason there's talk of peace is because of the Great Schism. Not really a good starting point for a friendship. Baz accepts the answer, and BB shows up to tell him to get to the bridge. Something to note here as well is that ODSTs, along with Phillips, are a bit nervous about BB since he's able to see and hear all for the most part along the ship. So they are trying not to say the wrong thing, knowing that BB could just tell Osman. Mal asks what the plan is, which Osman confirms that she does have one, almost sounding apologetic. She tells them that because of patchy comms, everywhere they will have to do some sort of reconnaissance of their own at times, which everyone is okay with. Then she drops the bombshell, telling everyone that she was part of the Spartan 2 program until she was 14, even that she knew Naomi and that they had trained together. Mal asks about the age 14, since the minimum age for was 18 for recruitment. Osman didn't miss a beat. They started at age 6 and got augmentations at 14, which is when she dropped out due to bad reactions. Everyone new to this information is in a state of shock. Baz notices a death stare from Naomi that could mean only one thing, traitor. Osman dismisses everyone knowing that she put a lot out there, and Mal asks BB if he's going to run off to her with everything that they say. BB tells him that, that they were obviously curious about the tension on board, so BB told Osman that she should address it. If they are going to have to trust each other, they need to get any secrets out of the way that could cause problems. Two hours later, they drop out of slipspace, and BB tells everyone what's come through comms. First being mail for some of the ODSTs. Naomi asks if is any news about John, and BB visibly pauses and then tells her that the UNSC is still looking, but it's not looking good. The Master Chief's most likely gone. Naomi then asks about Dr. Halsey, which Osmond tells her that she died on reach. Once they reach New Linelli, Osmond mentions that there's an informant on the ground that they may need to pick up if they can reach him. At first they get no response, but eventually he connects. Spencer is the man's name, who also happens to be an expert in Sangheili dialects and is more so than Phillips. Osmond tells him that they will pull him out after they do a scan of the planet. He acknowledges and signs off, to which everyone on Port Stanley heads to the rendezvous with Telcam to drop off the first shipment of weapons. Phillips makes contact with the shipmaster, who is happy to report that many more Sangheili come to his cause every day so the weapons will make a huge difference for his cause. After the conversation, they learn that Chatter amongst Telcam's crew had some questions if they can attack when the weapons are being delivered, but they are silenced quickly, since after all, they need the weapons to keep coming. Back on the shield world, within the second slipspace bubble, Lucy is looking around, alert, trying to figure out where she is. Eventually, she realizes she's in some sort of factory. She climbs under one of the giant vessels when she hears something moving nearby. She crawls underneath, moving towards the noise, but she sees no legs. Continuing to follow, she eventually decides that it's time to ambush whatever it is because it could be leading her into a trap. She kicks off the vessel, sliding on her back, out from under it, and shoots the target above her. Realizing it was a Huragak that could be rigged to explode, she fires and there's no detonation. The engineer falls down on her squealing. She got out from underneath it, seeing that it was still alive, and she tries to comfort it, but she couldn't explain that she was sorry. She couldn't say anything. So she held its head until it died, hearing other leathery noises, so more Huragak, coming closer, so she stands up to see more engineers looking at her. Back on Port Stanley, the ODSTs are getting ready to go down for the weapons delivery. Mal teasing Baz about Naomi, trying to get him to forget about his ex Chrissy, who had cheated on him when he was gone. BB shows up and asks if they are ready to go, and they all get grouped up and prepare to drop, because after they deliver the weapons, they will need to get Spencer and bug out. Mal asks about Ariadne, and BB states that they are still making repairs, and another UNSC ship, Monte Cassino, is going to give support, getting all non-essential crew off, so Venezia was still being useless. As they fly in, Dev lets everyone know that it's just the one elite and two brute guards chilling, so Telcam had kept his word. Osman, Phillips, and Vaz would ride in on a warthog with the trailer, Mal keeping them covered with a sniper rifle. They arrive, and Telcam is happy to receive the weapons. He asks about warships, but Osman tells him it would probably be embarrassing for both of them if she were able to get them some. Telcam then seemed to think that they would probably not need the ships anyways because it would be keeps versus keeps, not space battles. Osman then tells him that there will be more to come, and everyone leaves. On the way back to the ship, Mal notices a human coming towards them. Baz redirects the warthog towards him, and sure enough, it's a survivor named Tom Muir. Baz pulls Osman aside, since obviously this is not a great situation, and that they cannot leave this guy here, dead or alive, then suggests that they take him and drop him off at the next stop. She thinks about it and then agrees, and decides that that's exactly what they are going to do. They tell Tom that he's going to be extracted, and he's more pissy about it than anything because apparently they're seven years too late. So, not grateful at all. 
Back on Sanghelios, Jewel tells Raya that he needs to leave for a few days, going to Antam to meet with the Servants of the Abiding Truth. He asks her if she'd like to know why, and she just assumes that he's bored, and since there's no fighting, he's trying to find a place in the world now. He tells her that they are going to meet with some other Sanghili and figure out how the world should be governed. Forze is even going to be with him. Raya gives him a look and asks if he's plotting. Jewel admits that yes he is, but reassures her that he will not start a fight that he cannot win. Raya admits herself that she agrees with his point of view on the humans, even though she knows that they have different priorities. Jewel and Forze arrive in Anton later, and when getting to the temple of the monks, they are a bit nervous about how to get their attention. Jewel decides that they will just risk knocking on the door, and a voice from inside asks who they are and why they are there. Jewel and Forze introduce themselves and claim that they wish to bring Sanghelios back to its former glory. The door is then open and Telcam is the one who welcomes them. Both of them further state their grievances with the Arbiter and wish for him to be ousted. So Telcam welcomes them inside to join the Brotherhood. Back with Lucy inside the Shield World, she is surrounded by three other engineers, trying to explain to them how sorry she was about killing their friend, but obviously she's not able to communicate with them. So she put her weapon away and held her hands, palms up to show that she wasn't a threat, but all the engineers just sailed by her to grieve over their friend. So the Huragak did seem to care about more than just playing with technology. One of them eventually did turn around towards her and moved in her direction. Lucy hands it her helmet, and after a slight hesitation, it grabs the helmet and begins tinkering, taking it apart and then putting it back together, handing it back to Lucy, then staring at her, waiting to see how she reacts to his work. So she puts it on, and everything pretty much seems the same, except there are a couple new icons on her HUD. She activates the first one and finds out that her hearing was as clear as if she didn't even have the helmet on. When she tries to test the other icon, it didn't really seem to do anything. Then it dawned on her that if the first one, you know, messed with the hearing, this one probably did something with speech, which again, she's not able to use. She tries to talk, but ends up just coughing hard and getting more frustrated. The engineer reaches his tentacles out and pats her on the head, and then moves his tentacles to her chin and inspects her, kind of like how a dentist would. This freaks her out and she backs away, but then realizes that she has no one else to trust. So she allows him to try again, and the engineer places a tentacle on her neck and Lucy tries to make a noise. The engineer, after a moment, pulls away and starts to drift off. But after noticing that she wasn't following, he floats back, grabs her wrist, and gently leads her away. So Lucy follows. Back on Port Stanley, we get a look at the crew through BB's eyes, seeing Mal arguing with Muir and getting nowhere with him, then overhearing a conversation between Osman and Perangoski. Death reports still coming in, and a couple of names confirmed. James Ackerson, the first one recognizable, followed by Miranda Keyes. Then the two discuss Halsey, wondering where she could be. While bouncing around the ship, one of his fragments that's busy on Earth is slapping Hogarth's AI on the hands for trying to steal Parangoski's job. Just kind of shows the range of the AI since he's a fourth generation AI. Parangoski asks Osman why she didn't just have the evacuee executed, and Osman tells her that it probably would be bad for morale of her team if on the first mission she's killing civilians for being in the way, which the Admiral applauds. They prep to get Spencer and Osman decides that she will go and talk with the Civi herself. Once she arrives, Muir is very unhappy still with the situation and complains about being locked up. Osman tries to tell him that it's for security reasons and lies about trading bodies with the Covenant in the hopes that he would just buy it. Because if he doesn't, that's gonna be a problem. He continues to complain that it's still ridiculous and that he's locked up and accuses Osman of not understanding the lives that were lost on New Linelli, 1.4 million people. Then assumes that Earth wasn't even hit. <sighs> Unfortunate. Osman just responds telling him that oh, they understand plenty. They only lost a few billion on Earth and just walks away. Muir didn't say another word. Which to be fair, like I get why he's frustrated, but still, that, you know. Osman tells Mal that there's nothing to worry about with the Civi and tells Mal that if there were any issues, she would take care of it, not expecting any of the Marines to do it. Later, the team lands on Reigns, which is an old mining colony that the UNSC were using as a temporary listening post. Here is where Spencer has been for the past couple of years, and Osman decides it was time to pull him out. Baz and Mal get down off the dropship and walk around a bit, patrolling the area until Spencer finally comes out and lets them know that everything's taken care of. On their way back to the dropship, some Kigyar decide to test their luck. Mal and Baz try to, you know, just get them to go away, but the Jackals don't don't know that these humans happen to have backup in orbit. A shot fired from the ship hits 20 meters off to the right, causing all the jackals to hit the dirt, while Baz, Mal, and even Spencer light up all the jackals. Afterwards, Spencer shows his displeasure with the Marines because he had worked hard to create the relationship with them. But neither of them are really bothered. Osman actually isn't bothered either, and even asks them to bring a corpse and put it in the freezer. Could come in handy later. Back to Port Stanley, they go. Six hours later, they come out of slipspace near Monte Casino. The ship they were going to drop Spencer and Muir off with. However, they are still dealing with the whole Ariadne thing. Venezia still won't give any aid to the ship, and Monte Cassino is still five hours behind Port Stanley. 
and Port Stanley is still two hours away from Ariadne, but they will do what they can to get everyone off. Mal and Naomi continue conversing, but a slight flash of light is barely noticeable. Unfortunately, it was Ariadne exploding. And that is where we will leave off with part one of Halo Glasslands. I hope everyone enjoyed the summary and there will be more to come. Any comments or questions, be sure to leave them down below and I will do my best to respond to everybody. Like and subscribe to know for sure when more videos come out. Thanks again and see you in the next one. Check Chang out.